Hi, I'm Nate from The New Oil. This is Nick from Privacy Guys, and, and you're, you're listening, listening to, to Firewalls, Firewalls Don't, Don't Stop, Stop Dragons. Dragons. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I am your host, Kerry Parker. Today, we have episode 318 for April 3rd, 2023. And we've got a very interesting interview show for you today. It's not really a regular interview. It's more like a panel discussion with myself and uh, Nick from Privacy Guides and Nate from The New Oil. And if you have not heard of either of those sites, you really should have. Uh, they're great. Uh, if you've gone to my resources page on firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com, you would have found them. But they are really, really great resources for finding good privacy tools and privacy information in general. And I always say that you should get multiple sources. I, I love that you're a listener. I'm glad you like listening to this podcast. I hope you subscribe. I hope you've checked out the newsletter and the blog and all in the book and all these other stuff. But I'm one person, I've got my opinion, and I've done my personal research, but you should always get a second opinion. And it's good to hear things from other people's perspectives as well. And so these are great sites. Nate is also part of the Surveillance Report, another great podcast on privacy that he does with Henry from TechLore, another great website with great videos on how to protect yourself. So anyway, I reached out to these guys and said, hey, why don't we get together and just just have a little chat and kind of take people behind the scenes a little bit on what it's like to be a privacy advocate, what it's like to run a website where we are providing our opinions and making recommendations and deciding what applications and services and and so on get you know makes the cut and which ones don't, how we make those decisions. I just thought you might find it interesting to, to, to kind of go back behind the curtain a little bit and see what goes on with us as we do what we do in trying to help you, our audience, to become more private and more secure. Along the way, we'll talk about some of our personal aspects to this too, because if you think about it, it's kind of ironic. We are private people, not just privacy people, but private people. I mean, the reason we care about this stuff is because we don't necessarily want to share everything about ourselves with other people and privacy at its core. One of the more poetic ways I've heard privacy described is it's privacy is the ability to tell your story the way you want it told, sharing what you want to share, when you want to share it, with whom you want to share it under the conditions you want to share it. Just basically having control over your information and how you want to share that with other people. And so being private people, not just privacy people, we have made the the choice to put ourselves out there and be a lot less private so that we can help other people to become private. So anyway, that is the uh, setup for today's interview with Nate and Nick. A couple things before we get to the interview. Uh, I've got some exciting news for the podcast. I finally figured out, I think, a way to do automated transcripts. There's a really cool app for Mac called Whisper that is using some of this fancy AI technology that's all over the place right now to transcribe audio into text. I'm still playing with it, but uh, I think it's certainly good enough that I can go ahead and announce that I will be making this available somehow. I've actually got one of my patrons helping me with some of this work too. And my plan eventually at some point is to have like a podcast history page that lists all my episodes in order with dates and subjects and titles and, you know, the guest, if there was one, and hopefully a link to a text transcript of the episode. So stay tuned. I hope to be bringing that to you sometime soon. Also, after the interview, I will do a bonus Dear Carry question for today. Normally, I only do those on the news shows, but it kind of fit in well with uh, today's topic. So I thought I would cover that today. So we will do that right after the interview. Speaking of which, let's get to my interview with Nick from Privacy Guides and Nate from The New Oil. All right, guys, so the, thanks for doing this. This is a, I don't do panel discussions that often. Uh, this is going to be a little different than a standard interview, but I really appreciate you guys uh, coming on the show for this. We're all in the privacy space. We, all three of us, are in the position to recommend privacy and security stuff to other people. And that has some interesting 
side effects, I think, <laughs> uh, for us as people and what we do. So I, I, I thought it'd be interesting for us to kind of talk a little bit about what that means and how we do what we do and how we decide, you know, what we trust and how we recommend things. So first of all, this is Nate from The New Oil and Nick from Privacy Guides. Why don't you guys uh, give a quick introduction to yourselves? Uh, Nate, let's start with you. Um, sure. So uh, yeah, my name is Nate Bartram. I run The New Oil, which is a, uh, it's a website I describe it as a website that's di designed to make data privacy and cybersecurity accessible to people regardless of their technical background. And that includes the main focus is a website, but there's also, I do weekly blog. I try to do a weekly blog. I think I missed this week. Uh, <laughs> weekly current events podcast, very similar to what you do on your current events episodes or your news episodes. Mm -hmm. And um, also some YouTube videos that get mirrored to Odyssey and PeerTube. All right, Nick, how about you? Uh, well, my name is Nick. I'm uh... A volunteer for privacyguides.org and Privacy Guides is a non-profit collective which is run by volunteers to provide advice and guidance on various topics surrounding mainstream technology with the focus on improving one's privacy and security. All right, so as people who obviously value privacy, that's kind of our, our thing. Do you find it hard to put yourselves out there like, you know, so not only have you stepped in the spotlight, you've opened yourself to criticism and even attack. Is this is this a difficult decision? Do you have any regrets doing this? I know that that I struggle a little with this, but I'll, I'll save my answers for later. I, but uh, <laughs> Nick, let's, Nick, let's start with you. So, you know, you've got this guide. You've got all these recommendations. I know you've had to deal with people who say, hey, put me on your list. Why am I not on your list? Um, but, so we'll get to the evaluation part later, but does it bother you to open yourself up to criticism and attack for people? I mean, we're private people by default. Does it kind of yeah. weird to then be out and have a public facing thing? Well, it was a little bit awkward in the beginning. That was mostly because it was against my nature. For years, I've mm -hmm. been trying to delete as much data about me, well, out on the internet as possible. Right. And now I'm actually quite doing the opposite. But I guess the goal of increasing the general awareness of people about improving their privacy and security was so important for me that I just decided to step out to do my job better as a privacy advocate. It, 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 it's, you can get hit with all sorts of stress and insecurities while trying new things, like going on a stage or, well, mm. doing a, po a podcast that's not in your native language. <laughs> but <laughs> in, the, in, in the end, it's all worth it for me. And I've also got... At, some really great experiences that I wouldn't have been able to, to do if I re had remained anonymous, which I'm actually quite grateful for. So do you have any regrets? That, that, that do you, now that you've done this, do you, are there things you wish you'd done differently or are you happy to have done this still? I'm still very happy that I've done this. Uh, one thing I regret from the past was mostly participating in flame wars. When you work for an organization as large as Privacy Guides, you will always end up pissing off someone. Doesn't matter what <laughs> what, it, what you do. And before, mm -hmm. I always uh, try to engage with these folks. But now I see that that endeavor is simply just not worth my time. My time is just more well spent focusing on our work and just producing quality content. Yeah, oh, I hear that. Nate, how about you? Um, very similar. I think... Uh... I, I really struggled with imposter syndrome and I still kind of do mm. a little bit. Um, I'm definitely, I feel like I'm kind of like the newest guy on the scene and uh, very, I don't come from a technical background. So for me, it was a lot of like, I don't even know why people would want to listen to me necessarily, but I think that transparency has also worked in my favor of, you know, mm. not trying to pretend like I know it all and trying to stick to what I know, which is like the basic level stuff is really what I cater to. Like Nick was saying, I've, I've definitely had a lot of people not a lot of people, but I've definitely seen the comments where people are just like, oh, this guy goes on YouTube and publishes his face and he claims to be private. And in, in my opinion, I think that's just people misunderstanding the difference between privacy and anonymity. Like, yes, I'm not anonymous anymore, but I, I still have some control over my data. And um, not to sound like some kind of noble martyr or something, but I think it was kind of like Nick said, I, th I think it was worth it to come forward and be like, okay, I'm willing to give up a little bit of that anonymity and that privacy in order to help spread this message and help educate people. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and I'll echo a lot of those same things for myself. I, it's, I'm a private person and, and I, I never really even thought about it in terms of this when I was growing up. It just, it was just kind of, that's just me and that's how I operate. And so it was weird putting myself out there for, for the first time. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm used to it now. I've been doing it for several years, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it was strange. And 
And one of the things I did, one of the decisions I made early on when I started the blog, for example, is I turned off comments. I mean, I just, I, for, for all the comments, they probably would have been mostly great. I probably would have gotten a lot of, you know, nice ego stroking and, you know, and people saying, <laughs> oh, that's great. I love your content. And, but, you know, for, I'm sensitive enough that the, you know, for the, the couple people that just would just crap all over it and take issues with it and start these flame wars and nitpick everything to death, it would it would really bother me. And so I knew myself well enough to know I, I, I don't want to deal with that. So this is me. I'm putting myself out there. This is my content. And I hope you like it. But I don't want to really engage, uh, you know, with people about it. And even on social media, you know, if someone posts something nice, I'll usually like it and repost and whatever. But I don't often you know, get into conversations. There was somebody posted something on Mastodon recently and tagged me and, and they were saying, Oh, I love the book, but then I hate this part of the book. And I'm like, I, and I was like, so ready to respond that I was like, started to type. I'm like, Nope, 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 Nope. I'm just, you know what? I'm going to let that slide. I'm just, I'm not going to, like you said, I'm just, I'm not going to engage. So it, it, it for it's, it is, it's this weird thing with, uh, you know, for privacy people, we, we, <laughs> we value it. And yet we are putting ourselves out there anyway. Yeah, I'm definitely, uh, I'm starting to get big enough now that I'm starting to attract the more critical people. And uh, I've, I've found it really helps me to, you know, that whole trick, uh, it's a personal finance trick where you add something to your shopping cart, but then you leave it there for 24 hours mm. and you basically sleep on it. Mm -hmm. I found that's really helpful to me to just leave the comments and the emails. And then usually when I come back to them, either I'll be like, it's not worth replying or I'll just be like, you know, there's a better way to reply. And I've also, there was one time actually I wrote a whole email and then I saved it in drafts yep. and now I've just forgot. Like I just remembered it for the first time in six months. So not worth replying to. <laughs> well, yeah. one thing I did was just all, always uh, inviting critical people to join our GitHub page and open up an issue and state their arguments. But they never take us up for that. So <laughs> mm. it's an, it makes for an easy way to filter those people all. Yeah, that's a, that's a good response. That's what I need to start doing. <laughs> yeah, adding just a little bit of friction can can sometimes do the trick, and you know, make, getting someone to kind of formally commit to you know giving a constructive feedback as opposed to just kind of off the cuff social media crapping on something. Yeah, that that's an idea. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, there there are so many products and services out there. We are we of all people are painfully aware of this, and they change constantly. So what? How do you stay on top of everything? How do you keep your finger on the pulse of the privacy world and keep in touch with what's going on. What are, what are your personal techniques for keeping up with what's going on? Nate, how about you start this time? Well, me, I have a, uh, I have a Twitter and a Mastodon account that I use as a newsfeed where I just publish articles that I think are, are relevant and interesting to privacy and security. They're personally curated. It's not a bot. Mm -hmm. And I, I get those articles from an RSS feed that draws from, a lot of different blogs from mm. the various services that I recommend, but also actual news sources like Wired, Ars Technica, Slashdot, d tons of news sources. And then also in a separate section, I also follow some subreddits like r slash privacy and r slash privacy guides. And um, I think between all of those, I I feel like I get a pretty good idea of what's going on out there, but also new services. You know, if there's something new on the scene, people will ask about it usually on Reddit. And if, if it's something that I'm curious, like if I see it keep popping up or I'm like, oh, I've, I've wondered about this too, then I can click on the comments and see what other people are saying. So that's the main way that I stay up to date with all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, actually me too. I've got several RSS feeds that I, I have a reader app that I use, Feedly is what I've been using. Uh, there are several out there, but it's an RSS feed thing, which is really nice, a way to aggregate all this kind of inf coming information. And there's, I've got, you know, a couple dozen sources that I follow kind of like you. I'd love to actually get into Reddit, but Reddit and even the like hacker news, but they're like fire hoses. There's just so much information yeah. and I can't find a good way to filter it down to what I really want to see without, cause I, I mean, I don't have time to sort through a hundred things a day to find the five that are interesting. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> Nick, how about you? What, how do you keep, keep in touch with what's going on there? Well, to keep it short, we don't, <laughs> we try to keep, uh, <laughs> to keep up as good as possible, but you can just simply can simply cannot be aware of all the things that are happening out there all the time. But, that's why it's, well, easy to have an, uh, a big community like Privacy Guides because all our followers and our community members help us keep up to date on these kinds of things. They make us aware of things that we might have skipped over. 
Yeah, that is very true, and that's a and so and this is one of the reasons that we three in, uh, are in touch is we've actually got a little private group where we keep in touch with each other on Signal, which is kind of nice. Yeah. And so we, I know that I count on you guys a lot of times actually to bring things up, and we bring things up to each other. So we've got our own little community, a very small, tight little knit community, which is great. Yeah, uh, which helps me quite a bit. And then I, it's a lot of times my patrons uh, bring things to my attention that I had not seen before. We've got a little way to share that information on our Discord server. And so, yeah, it, it, now that I've done this long enough, I'm part of a few small communities that also help me keep in touch with all these things. So that's that's kind of a self-fulfilling thing, I guess. But that's worked out actually pretty well. Yeah. In, instead of strength in numbers, in this case, it's actually more like knowledge in numbers. Say that again. It's more like what? It's more like knowledge in numbers instead uh, of a strength in numbers. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, I agree. All right. So how often have you had to remove products that you've previously recommended and and, and why? Like, can you give me some specific examples? I've got several I'll, I'll, that I'll give, but I, and I know you guys do too. So what are some like <laughs> the, the main anecdotes where you've been recommending something for a while and all of a sudden you had to bite the bullet and say, nope, I got to remove that. One of the bigger things that we uh, removed recent now, well, not recently, but that we removed back when we are still called privacy tools was a start page, for example, that uh, caused mm. a big, uh, quite a big splash. That was because they were so sold to system one, it was, I recall. And they were giving all kinds of fake PR uh, statements about what's the percentage uh, that, that, that system wants, uh, owns off start page and all those uh, sort of details. And to keep it simple, we just didn't trust the whole, the whole company anymore. Not until they mm. provi provided uh, the answers that we wanted. But yeah, that, that just caused a, uh, quite a big uh, commotion in the privacy community back then. <laughs> yeah. I remember Nate, that, yeah. Nate, how about you? <laughs> I haven't had to remove a lot of things, thankfully. There's been a few. Wicker comes to mind. Uh, yeah. I was very... I loved Wicker, man. I really did. I was so sad. I removed them. I think it was either uh, Michael Basil on his show was talking about how he was setting up some like Wireshark traffic analysis, and uh, he noticed it was making calls home to like Microsoft and I think a couple other places... And he tried to contact Wicker and they were just kind of giving him the runaround, not really giving him answers on what that traffic was or why. And um, for the record, I don't base all my decisions on him, but he's credible enough that I was like, OK, that's really suspicious. And then like two weeks later, they were sold to Amazon and I was like, all right, definitely gone now. Right. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. And then um, C Templar, of course, went under, went out of business and uh, I was rooting for them, too, unfortunately. So had to remove them. It's usually like like Nick said. It's about trust. You know, if there if there's something that happens that you I can no longer trust this company, whether it's the parent company or yeah, something to that effect. It's like I said. Thankfully, I hadn't have haven't had to remove a whole lot yet. But I'm sure as time goes on, new things will pop up, old things will go away. So yeah, and there's and I've actually been able to talk to a lot of founders of privacy products lately. I've talked to the simple login folks. I've talked to Panquake folks. I've talked to some uh, standard notes guys, uh, a guy, but it, it's interesting to get to talk to the directly those people and ask them things about, you know, what happens if someone wants to buy you out? You know, what's your price tag, you know, and what does that mean for you? And, and of course, Raphael from saving too. And, and they all have different takes on that, but, you know, and they all, of course, want to say that, you know, nothing will happen, but then, you know, like, look, look you, you just don't know, look at WhatsApp, right? WhatsApp was say what you want about them, but they, they were kind of a, they were pretty privacy focused for a long time. They had, they had ended encryption and then they got bought out by Facebook. And then even the people that started that left because they just, you know, for all the promises that Facebook made to them about what they weren't going to do, they did. And mm -hmm. so, you know, buyouts and investments from VCs who want, you know, money turn around. There's all sorts of different ways that, that really good companies can be subverted you know, from the profit motive or by having new overlords or whatever. And I think LastPass felt some of that maybe when they got bought out by Log Me In. Maybe that's when some of the things started turning for them. I recommended them for years. That's that's probably the most prime example of somebody that I recommended for years and used and had to change my mind. And it, that one was a little bit weird, a little bit more touchy. I, I'm not as harsh on them as I think a lot of people have been. The worst part for that for me was how they handled it. You know, mm -hmm. the fact that you're breached, you know, that's going to happen. I'm, I hate to say it, but it doesn't. So it's really how you respond to those things. And I didn't like their response. 
And then we find out that over the years, they haven't been keeping their clients up to date and forcing people to upgrade their, you know, PPK DF2 iterations and things like that. And that was, that was problematic. And it's really hard. I mean, I mean, so we're all in a position where we recommend stuff and I feel a responsibility to my audience to recommend the best stuff. And yet sometimes you got to change your mind. Things change and then you got to explain it. And then you feel, you know, are people going to trust me? I don't know. But any more thoughts on that, guys? No, I, I definitely feel your pain. I um, I was one of those people that also used to recommend LastPass. And uh, over the years, I've moved over to Bitwarden, but especially now in light of that data breach and everything, I'm like, all these people that I was like, yeah, I was, was preaching LastPass, but not anymore. And it's weird because everybody understands that technology moves so fast and changes so much. But at the same time, there's still kind of that like weird look when people are like, well, why don't you recommend this anymore? And it's hard to explain because technology changes and it used to be a really solid recommendation. And now I think there's better ones. Yeah. Well, the other problem, of course, too, is that everyone's got a different threat model and everyone's got a different tolerance. And so my kind of my space is like the easy button. I want to be able to recommend for, you know, 90% of the people on the planet, the, the easiest thing that people can use turnkey. One of the things I was getting blowback on for that Mastodon thing was from somebody who really likes Android. And they're like, well, oh, Android can be really private if you do it right. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to tell my mom to install a custom ROM, you know, <laughs> on, on a phone or, and explain to them how to work around the Google Play Store. And, you know, like so that that's not my beat. Like, you know, I understand that it can be, and I understand where this person's coming from, but that's not my audience. But you guys probably have different audiences and I'm sure you've got different people who say, how can you recommend this product? that's you know, owned by a corporation that's in part of the 14 eyes. And I'm like, eh, you know, <laughs> if that's your threat model, you know, then I'm not sure I could find anything that's going to work for you. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> how do you, how do you decide what, where, where your level is? How do you, if something is from the 14 eyes countries, do you immediately take it off your list? For example, I mean, how do you make, how do you draw that line? Well, we used to think that way, but these days we are taking a new approach to actually just hammer down in people's minds that they first always need to threat model. You cannot recommend anything without knowing their threat model. Not everyone wa wants, uh, wants to be the next Edward Snowden. Right. If you try to try to hide some, something from your little sister, it's way different than when you try to hide something from the NSA. <laughs> The NSA right. by, uh, might have access to all kinds of software tools, but your little sister knows that you, leave, uh, uh, that you left your computer unlocked while you went to the bathroom. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Nate, how about you? Like, where do you, how do you draw that line? Where do you where do you come down on what things you can't recommend because they don't fit a certain profile or whatever for your audience? So um, I actually have a very similar audience to you. It's funny you mentioned your mom because that's actually my target audience too is my, <laughs> my own mother, uh, my own brother, my siblings. I'll, yeah. I'll message them and uh, try to get feedback from them, especially with the website. You know, is this understandable? Is this approachable? And um, I actually, it's funny, Nick mentions the, the 14 eyes thing. One of your uh, staff members the other day actually convinced me that I should stop listing the the country of origin for a service as well. So I've stopped doing that too. Yeah. Hmm. And I've added a page explaining basically what he said. Like, look, if, if country of origin is a threat, a threat for you, then like, this is beyond my scope. I can't help you. I'm, I'm focused on, like you said, like trying to get the, the low hanging fruit. And yeah. I'm very upfront about that. I'm not, I fully recognize there's, you can take this stuff to the extreme. You know, mm -hmm. you can uh, install a custom OS. You can compile your own Linux kernel from scratch and all this crazy stuff. <laughs> I'm just trying to get the low hanging fruit and get everybody up to what I would say is like the new minimum, you know, using a password manager, using two factor, switching to an encrypted email provider, things like that. So yeah. And there's, I definitely, I've had to explain that to people before too. There's <laughs> uh, real quick on my YouTube channel, my intro video is, you know, this is the new oil. Here's what we do. And I specifically made that video because I got tired of people leaving comments that were like, well, what about this crazy high advanced thing? And it's like, look, yes, but that's not my target audience. You're right. in the wrong place. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, me too. And that's, that is my go-to as well. It's like, and I try to, you know, in my book, at the very beginning, I try to lay it out like, look, this is, I, I'm going to make some calls on your behalf here because I think that simplicity is better and convenience is better. Uh, I'm definitely going for the low hanging fruit, definitely going for the, the simplest, easy button answers I can get for most people. Because I mean, 
I'm like, my gosh, if we all did just those things, we'd all be so much better off. And then, you know, exactly. great. If we could get there, then let's worry about going to the you know next level. And, you know, and I still every once in a while, just for funsies, I'll say, all right, if you really want to put on the tinfoil hat, you know, check this out, especially if it's something that's not that difficult or, or, or whatever. I'll still throw that out for people to use, you know, like setting up a pie hole at home or, th- you know, some kind of little more projecty kind of things that people can do. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think you've just got to set expectations and 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 then go from there. And I totally and completely respect anybody who's got the wherewithal and the patience to to do some of these really heavy duty things. And you know, more power to you. Please do those things. But for my audience, for my recommendations, you know, that's that's just not where I'm going to go. All right. Yeah, so, I do, um... <laughs> go ahead. Sorry, I was, I was just going to say, for what it's worth, my site does actually recommend, like, here's some more advanced stuff. You know, like I on yeah. the mobile phones pages, I do say, like, for maximum privacy and security, look into a custom OS. Here's a couple to look into. I, I think on my Android settings, I make a note about, like, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do. Here's a link to privacy guides page that lists some more advanced stuff. But I make it very clear. It's like, this is way outside the scope of my site. I'm not going to go into that. But here's where you can get more info. So. Yeah, exactly. I try to give people pointers to those things if they're interested. If you know, for the concerned student, for the concerned reader, if you want, you know, if you want to take that next step further, here's some options. But yeah, I, you know, I don't, and I don't claim to be smart enough or knowledgeable enough to really take them down this path and make recommendations at that level. It, it, it's beyond me, and and I admit that. But I know enough about it to know. Hey, look over there. These people, you know, can help you if you want to do that. Mm-hmm. All right. So, I, we've already kind of touched on this here, I think, but I think the, the listeners might find this funny, but there is a hierarchy. Like there's like, there's, they trust us. And then, but then there's people that we trust. Like the reason I use LastPass for so many years is because Steve Gibson, who uh, is, runs the security now podcast, or is the main person on the security now podcast recommended that to me many years ago. And he had gotten private access to the code and the owner and had a chance to talk to them. And, you know, that was six, seven, eight years ago. But at the time, it was like, that's good enough for me. And so I, I he recommended that to me and then I recommend it to others. So there's this like, it's almost like certificate authority system. Like there's this, 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 this hierarchy of privacy people that we trust. So people look to us, but who do you look to? Like, where do you guys go? Like, who do you, and you already mentioned Michael Bazell, for example, I've talked about Steve Gibson. I'm just curious when you guys go up the next level of the hierarchy, who are you looking to, to make recommendations that you then pass on? Nick, let's start with you. Well, most often I just look to lead pro- to project leaders from various open source projects that I follow. One one example, maybe Daniel McKay from Graveen OS. Another example would be, uh, well, she's not technically a lead uh, anymore, but Joanna Rutkowska from uh, from Cubes OS, for example. Often those uh, those people have very deep understandings of how certain systems and software, uh, software solutions work. And they can give you some real insights in what the next big thing will be, where the where the, where the biggest new improvements uh, are going to be made. How many of the products that you recommended have you actually managed to establish direct contact with the the owners of those projects? Let me I don't know rough off the top of your head percentage wise. I mean, how many of the products that you recommend do you have direct connections with where you can say, "Hey, I've got a question about this," or "You just made this change. Why did you do that?" You know, where you can actually go to the source and find out about it as opposed to learning about it like the rest of us schmoes from other places <laughs> well most often it will be about 80 90 well, percent oh, wow. most project leads are, are actually quite responsive and sometimes they even uh, jump in themselves they they mm-hmm. are they, they they often just uh, randomly appear on our forums and uh, and get up to well enlighten other users about uh, certain use cases so it seems like we follow them but they follow us too <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, I've been in this long enough that I'm starting to get some of that now too. It's 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 a small community actually when it's all said and done. Yeah. Uh, so that's great. It, I, which I've it, it's great to have kind of that access. But you're right. A lot of these people we're all in the same headspace. So we're all we all want to help each other. We all want to we all have the same goal. So just like the three of us talking here today, I mean we <laughs> we're doing this. You know, I mean some of us do it to make, to make money, but a lot of us aren't. And, and it's a it's really about helping people improve their privacy and security. And, and you find that other people like that too, and they tend to be very helpful. Nate, how about you? So who do you, who do you look to for advice on this kind of stuff? And what kind of, you know, have you managed to make some great connections yourself? Weirdly, I don't look to any specific person. Sure. Yeah. I generally look to, I look to a lot of different people and it's, I generally just look for people I trust. Um, mm-hmm. 
and privacy guides is definitely one source I look to. I look to uh, Henry from TechLore every now and then. I'll pick his brain on something. Or you mentioned like there's uh, some Signal group chats that I know you and I are in one. Some of the people in there I might ask questions to. I might even go to like public forums, you know, like the privacy guide mm-hmm. matrix room or even my own matrix room. There's some people that are smarter than me in there. And uh, I, I feel like when you have regulars and people that you keep seeing their names pop up, you kind of get a feel for who knows what they're talking about and who doesn't, especially when there's other people in there that are kind of <laughs> spreading like conspiracy theories, not necessarily intentionally, mm-hmm. but just they don't know any better. You know, I saw this YouTube video that said X, Y, Z, and somebody will come in and be like, well, actually, it's not quite true. Here's how this works and here's why. And um, yeah, I look to a lot of different people and I kind of just, um, I kind of consider their uh, their reputation in that sense. Mm-hmm. They're, you know, are does this person generally know what they're talking about or or not? Yeah, and I, I also do kind of look at overall consensus in the general community, which is not always the way to go. Sometimes the hive mind is definitely a thing. But uh, <laughs> again, you know, I, I kind of look for those people that, seem to know what they're talking about, seem to ha- actual have actually have expertise in this, like like Nick was saying. And if you can find specific people, I think that's probably the best. Like, I think I follow uh, Matthew Green on Mastodon, mm-hmm, who's a mm-hmm. cryptographer at, what is it, John Hopkins? I, I think. think that's yeah, right. Yeah, John Hopkins. A lot of the stuff he says goes way over my head, but at least when I know he's, like, making a post about something, it's like, okay, this is something I should pay attention to. So um, definitely need yeah, to I find more him people well. like that for sure. But Yeah, and I think, that, you know, like Alex Stamos is another person that I think is really interesting to, to follow. There's a guy named Nick Weaver at Berkeley that I interviewed a long time ago. He doesn't do a lot uh, that I followed recently, but it, there are people that I know of in the industry. It's uh, Bruce Schneier. Um, yeah, that I, I follow his you know, blog. I, He's great. I like to listen to what they have to say. And it, and I think the other thing that if that maybe the audience is picking up on is I, you need to be humble. Like I think you need to understand that you're not you know, the only person who has an opinion on this that's going to be right. And so one of the things I look at, one of the things that, that will you know give me a trust plus on people is they'll say, look, I, I, this is what I think. You should also listen to other people. Uh, I don't mm-hmm. think I'm, you know, I don't pretend to be the person who has the answer because there is no one answer for everybody. And so I, I, I think that the, the humbleness kind of comes with the territory too. And, and the first, one of the first red flags for anybody, for me, is someone who says, this is the answer. Don't look anywhere else. Don't listen to anyone else. They're all wrong. I'm right. As soon as I hear that, that's an immediate red flag. Now, there are some people that are smart enough. That might be true. Uh, but I appreciate the people who are willing to at least say, you know what? Look, this is what I think. This is why I think this. Here's some other inv- opinions you might check out. Agreed. Yeah. Most often, those types of people will, uh, will also try to sell you something. She's like a North <laughs> yes. VPN. Maybe. Yeah, it's funny how that tends to correlate, right? <laughs> a VPN yeah. or a, a phone mm. with their own custom OS on it. Right. So, the, the, VPN, <laughs> the VPN industry is really toxic. It's like the new, uh, the, oh. the new antivirus uh Oh, it's horrible, industry. yeah. Mm-hmm. They just pretend that if you install their VPN, all your problems go away. World peace will, will, will be... Silver uh, bullet, yeah. ...will be achieved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if, let, uh, let's talk about that. Yeah, go ahead. So, so, so yeah, tell me some more. I was just going to say, if, you're, uh, if your viewers haven't checked it out, um, Naomi Brockwell, at the time of this recording, she put out a video about five months ago that really hit the nail on the head. It's like a 15-minute yep. video that goes through all the, with facts and articles like she does, goes through all the details about here's what's wrong with the VPN industry, here's why you need to tread lightly, here's what they do, here's what they don't do. It's a fantastic video. I actually just remembered I need to link to that on my site. It's a great video. So, Yeah, I, I like a lot of the stuff she does. I'd love to get her on the program sometime. She does some great some great stuff. She was on Michael Bazell's show that recently mm-hmm. too. That, that was an interesting little Q&A that they did. Yeah, I remember uh, that. Session. She was great. So on the VPN thing, I've been talking about this recently too. It's definitely not a silver bullet, but what gets me more than anything is what's going on behind the scenes that a lot of people don't know is all this consolidation. A lot of these companies are all owned by the same company. So they they have six products, but behind the scenes, they're all the same company. And then to make matters worse, they buy up the companies that do the reviews too. (laughs) So, you know, shocker of shockers, these review sites tend to, you know, tend to rate the the products they, they ultimately own higher than the other products and it's just gotten so bad and you're right i think it is similar to the antivirus industry as well uh it's just way too much uh, what's the word collusion maybe collusion is a strong word but still it's it, it's conspiracy it's a, conspiracy for sure <laughs> and yeah a lot of conflict of interest certainly a lot of inherent conflict of interest yeah so given all that what <laughs> what vpns still make it through like what are your go-to vpns for me personally it's a proton vpn 
just so to say, I am a kind of a sucker for ecosystems. And mm. I must say, Protomail is one of the few companies that actually seem to have been creating something like it. Yeah, I really like, yeah, me too. I like Proton Whale as well. I, I've tried others, plenty of others, Mailfence and Tutanota and some of the other ones. And I keep coming back to Proton Mail. And I use Proton VPN as well. I've heard a lot of people really love Mulvad as well. Mulvad and sometimes Tunnel, Tunnel Bear. They usually get high ranks. Nate, what do you think? Um, yeah, no, Proton's great. I do. I think especially for um, for the average person, you know, we, we were talking earlier about like just turnkey solutions like yeah. Proton has that ecosystem. It has mail. It has VPN. Now they have drive. They have calendar. And for the record, they still got a ways to go. They're, you know, they're behind the mainstream offerings in that sense. But I think especially once they get some of that stuff polished out, I, I think they're going to be a really powerful possibility for a lot of mainstream users. Mulvad's really good. What I really like about Mulvad is they seem to be constantly pushing for better security and privacy for their users. Like a while back, they got rid of cryptocurrency returns. You can't, they offer mm -hmm. like a 30 back money day guarantee, but not for cryptocurrency because in order to do that, they would need to keep a record of mm -hmm. what address paid this cryptocurrency mm -hmm. and they don't want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. They got rid of ongoing subscriptions for the same reason because they don't want to keep records of who's buying stuff. They've implemented, at least on some of their servers, they've implemented post-quantum safe encryption on their mm. tunnels. Uh, and then just most recently, they actually had an audit of like their payment system, which I've never heard of a company auditing that of all things. So mm. they're, they, they seem like they're constantly trying to like do better and and be better which i really appreciate and um yeah i'm also personally a really big fan of ivpn uh full disclosure at this time they are a sponsor of the new oils website mm -hmm. but um i just remember i, I wish i could find articles because i've said this before and i can't remember the articles but i remember on surveillance report there was like a, a month where researchers were finding all these new vulnerabilities in vpns and every single article specifically mentioned like this doesn't affect IVPN because of <sighs> some way that they do their encryption or some some policy they have in place. It's like, yeah, this doesn't apply to them. Uh, so they have huh. really good security and they're also just really committed, just like uh, Mulvad and I think maybe Proton as well. They're really committed to like ethical transparency. We don't do uh, affiliate programs. We don't pay for reviews. Proton does have an affiliate program, but they don't pay for reviews. We don't you know tell people what to say, any of that. So yeah, those are my three. I, I like them a lot. I've also heard of Windscribe. I've heard good things about them, but I've never personally used them. So funny that you, uh, that you touch on Windscribe because now that I recall, Windscribe also made a map where you can basically see mm -hmm. how like about seven to eight companies own more than 100 uh, different VPNs. If you, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, if you really look, uh, look right from a helicopter view, then you can see that the uh, VPN space is actually quite consolidated. It mm -hmm. seems like there are a lot of uh, different VPNs, but it's all more of the same with a different coat of paint. Right. Yeah. So here's, here's a potentially controversial question. I generally tell people, certainly on Mac, that they're probably better off not using antivirus software that there's enough built into the Mac OS that if you just have good internet hygiene, you're probably better off. Because to me, I, I've seen a, where a lot of antivirus software has caused more problems than they've solved. They mine your data in a lot of cases, which I really don't like. Uh, they have to give special privileges. I always, the, the analogy I always make is it's like hiring a bodyguard. You know, that bodyguard needs to know everything. They need to be able to, you know, they need to know where your drug dealer is. They need to know who your mistress <laughs> is that, you know, because if they want to protect you, they need to go with you everywhere you go. But you can have a, you, you know, you can have a legal contract that those guys can sign an NDA that you could sue them for if they screw up. You can't, you know, for antivirus software, you're inviting them into the door and you're giving them full access to everything. And I, and you sign away all sorts of stuff. I don't, I don't like that. But my, my point of view is that if on a Mac, at least if you're practicing good internet hygiene, you're probably doing fine. Cause there's, there's, there are some, it's not really antivirus. There are some built in things in, in the operating system that will help you out. And then on windows, I usually just tell people to use windows defender. Uh, and not to use another for pay like McAfee and Norton, whatever. But I'm really curious to know what you guys think. So, uh, Nate, what about you? What, what, what do you recommend uh, when people ask you, what antivirus software should I use? Uh, I actually agree with you. I don't <laughs> think if you do the proper search terms, you know, you do some research. And, and, and I say proper search terms in the sense of like, I'm not looking for what's the best antivirus, but like, do I need an antivirus? Mm. Yeah, Mac is notoriously very secure. And I'm not going to say they're unhackable because they're not. We've definitely seen malware built for Mac. 
but it's right. generally the exception rather than the norm. And uh, same thing with Windows. Like back in the day, Defender was really, really bad. But over the years, it's come a long way and it's actually really, really good. And a lot of experts agree that you really generally don't need antivirus. There's pretty much only a few situations where you would. Like um, if you were maybe the IT guy at a big company, then mm -hmm. maybe you would want that. But at that point, you're, you kind of want access to everybody's machine anyways to make sure they're not installing things they shouldn't be and things like that. Right. Yeah. Corporate corporate environment is definitely a little different than home environment. I, I, yeah. Again, my audience is home environment. <laughs> yeah, 100%. But yeah, generally speaking, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to say you'll nobody ever needs one because there's always exceptions like we've been saying mm -hmm. this whole time. But generally speaking, 99% of the time, I'd, I'd agree. I don't think people need an antivirus. Just use basic common sense. Don't impulsively click on every single link. <laughs> don't impulsively download every single attachment. Mm -hmm. Things like that. So. Right. All right, Nick, what about you? Well, I personally agree with it as well, but I, I'm more, more, more looking uh, at it from a security point of view rather than a privacy point of view, because you have this privileged uh, process which has access to everything, which is also closed source. If mm. just some hacker finds a hole in the antivirus program, then boom, they now have access to everything on your computer quite easily, right. especially mm -hmm. the ones with the... Uh, with the browser uh, extensions uh, tend to be problematic. Yep. Yeah. So as we've already mentioned a little bit, you can't you can't please everyone. And I and I know that you guys have to deal with companies and, and users who disagree with your recommendations. <laughs> we've talked a little bit about some of this before. And sometimes, you know, vehemently. They you know, they'll they'll really get up in your <laughs> in your face about it. So <laughs> how do you handle that? And I, I don't just mean functionally, like how do you handle even negative feedback and try to make it constructive, but you know, just psychologically, how do you, how do you, how do you deal with a pushback from, from companies to say, Hey, you know, you should be listing my product or you used to list my product and now you don't, I don't know how much that blowback you get, but what do you do? How do you deal with that? Nick, I, I want to start with you on this one. Uh, we don't get a lot of blowback from companies most often. We do sometimes get negative feedback from individual developers, which get, Basically, but hard that we delist the delisted their their beloved app. Mm -hmm. um, but most often, we just try to stay professional and just divert them to the information that that they need to 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 solve the issue to get relisted, if that's even possible at all. Most often, it's like an app, for example, which is a few Android APIs behind, which means it has worse privacy than more modern apps, for example. One thing that they can do is just update their app to use the newest uh, APIs, but mm. most often they just won't. They just won't do that. <laughs> well, I, I know I don't want to bring up the specific product because I don't want to. I don't want to go there. But I know you recently have been dealing with somebody who is is trying to get listed on your on your on your thing, and they're they're explaining yep. why they should be, Skip. and you're explaining why they shouldn't be. Well, <laughs> okay, Skip. I was going to say the name, but <laughs> but. A transparency, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure, I guess. As long as you're the one to say it, I'm not the one who's going to deal with it. Uh, and you already deal with it. So, part, I mean, but part of what you're trying to do is you've actually come up with criteria. I mean, you actually are working through, you know, making this a formal thing where it's not just your opinion. It's not just you saying, well, I like this, I don't like that. It's you actually have a list. Like you, you're actually going yeah. through and it's like, this is this is what you need to qualify. Tell us a little bit about how you do that and how you came up with your 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 list of criteria. Well, we uh, most often actually look at uh, criteria about things that that have the most well technical merit. We try to, we try to uh, not get, uh, get our emotions into it, but sometimes we do sprinkle in a little bit of idealism in there. Mm -hmm. I must say, I didn't make the criteria in this case myself. That was mostly a process done by da done by Daniel and Jana in this case. So I can't speak a lot about the. Uh, the, the choices that were made in this case but we do try to professionalize the privacy guides and also just make it easier for developers to know what needs to be at least met before they can be listed but we also just want to press that these are a minimum requirements they are not uh, a minimum requirements to get listed but to be considered to be listed because sometimes uh, some companies just assume that they will automatically be added Right. There's a subjective element and usually comes down to trust. 
And that is, that's where it gets a little bit subjective, right? It's, it, there's not a lot of things you could point to right. that says, well, this is why I trust you. This is why I don't trust you. You could talk about it, but it's not more of a tech. There, there's the technical aspects, which is pretty straightforward. You know, use the latest APIs on Android or, you know, make sure that you're, in, you're, don't have conflicts of interest and, you know, with other companies, you know, you could do that kind of stuff, but there are, yeah, there's always going to be a subject, some minimal element of subjectivity to this. Nate, how about you? So I, I, <laughs> well, have you run into this problem a lot? Is how, how do you determine, do you have a, do you have your own list of criteria? How do you work it? I do. Um, I haven't run into this problem too much. But when I have, I mostly hide behind the criteria. Like, sorry, you don't meet the criteria. So not my fault, <laughs> even though I wrote them. Um, <laughs> and I could change them. <laughs> yeah. Ah, if only somebody could change that. Um, <laughs> Moving goalposts. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. No, but yeah, so I. Uh, that's the main thing I look at is does it meet the criteria? And um, I do. I don't know. That's That's the biggest thing for me. But I'm always... It's it's kind of tricky because in a way it is it, it would be moving the goalpost. But if I if a project comes uh, to my attention that so here's the way I look at it: if a project comes to my attention that I genuinely don't think should be recommended, I try to put that into words and add that mm. to the criteria. So for mm. well, okay, for example, uh, XMPP, which for the record I'm a huge fan of XMPP. I really like it, but it's also really not user friendly. Mm. And um, Actually, this applies more to Telegram than XMPP. Uh, okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Let me let me let me shift gears here because this was a, a side effect of that. So Telegram, I don't think should be recommended for a lot of reasons. And one of the reasons that I was able to put into words was it's not default encrypted, uh, or it's not mm-hmm. encrypted by default. You have to enable mm-hmm. end-to-end encryption. And so when I added that criteria, I realized, oh crap, that removes XMPP for as well because XMPP mm-hmm. is the same way. You can't. It's not by default. You have to go in and enable it, which is really not hard to do. Neither is it in Telegram. And personally, I was willing to let that recommendation go because, like I said, it's not very user friendly. You surprisingly, have not had any pushback from that. I don't know if anybody's noticed or anything, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I try to find the the I, basically that's what it is. I try to put into words why I think something shouldn't be recommended when I come up with the criteria. And I, I know that sounds kind of like I'm I'm kind of trying to like justify my reasons, but that's also why I publicly publish the criteria. As, you know, if anybody thinks like, well, this isn't fair, then go ahead and op- open an issue. I'm you might be right. I've changed my mind on many, many things. And that's because I'm human and I make mistakes and I'm always learning new things and things are changing. But yeah, I mainly try to have that criteria to be as objective as possible. Like you guys said, like nothing's ever going to be 100% objective. There's always going to be the human element there. But I try to make it at least as transparent as possible. I don't know if that made sense. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And <laughs> and I agree completely. And I don't really, I'm not quite in the recommendation space that you guys are. So I I don't have any criteria for what makes my list of resources other than I think this is cool. Uh, you know, and I, I, it's, I found it helpful, you know, so if, I'm at a much lower stage than you guys are as far as those kind of recommendations go. But what I also think that the converse way to look at this is these are goals. Like these are now roadmaps for other people who want to get listed like this. These are things that they could be doing to make their products better. And, and you guys are probably mm-hmm. like, please, please meet my criteria. Like we want more, doing this. I will, I will, if you have questions, I will help you, you know, meet these criteria. I want you to meet my criteria, right? It's, yeah. it's not about being exclusive. We want to, we want to bring as many as possible. We just have standards. That's all. And then it should be viewed as a way to make products better so that we can get more things on the list. Right. Yeah. But also, it's also about creating well, a positive effect on the wall space. If you are moving the goalposts up, then, then it means that all companies will have to keep up. Attackers are not going to sit still, and mm. by that logic, defenders shouldn't either. And by moving the goal, the goalpost up and up and up, you can just keep adding more security and better privacy for the end users. That's true. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, we should always be raising the bar. Yeah, because like um, like messengers, for example, there's I've I've said this before. There's so 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 many messengers out there. And, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, yeah, you're right. Cause if you, you start filtering out, like you add me personally, I add more criteria to filter out the ones I don't think should be listed. And now it forces those <laughs> ones to go back and do better. Yeah, that's true. That's a really good way to, to think about it. I also, oh, I remember I was going to say, I also, on my side, at least we have like minimum criteria and also preferred criteria. So mm-hmm. you can, you can still be listed if you don't have the preferred, but it's also like, Hey, it'd be really cool if somebody went and did this. So yeah. Right. All right, guys, as we wrap this up, what makes you most hopeful about the future of privacy? And then, 
you know, conversely, maybe what worries you most looking at, you know, looking in the crystal ball, seeing where things are going, looking at the news lately, what gives you hope and what, what maybe makes you worry? Uh, I don't know who wants to pick that one up. <laughs> who, wants to, who wants to start? You want to go first, Nick, or you want me to? Uh, you can go first this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so the thing that makes me the most hopeful is I feel like privacy is becoming more mainstream in the sense that um, it used to be, it used to be like Facebook, for example. If I, I, I deleted Facebook many years ago. Great decision. Totally encourage it to everybody. <laughs> and uh, it used to be like if I told people it was for privacy, they would kind of give me weird looks. Or, or it, it not not so much told them it was for privacy. It was just in general. If I was like, I don't have Facebook, people would look at me like, you don't have Facebook? Like, how right. do you exist? But nowadays, it's so funny because I run into people that like, oh, yeah, I don't have Facebook. And they're like, oh, my God, I'm so jealous. And, <laughs> and I really do all the time. And and yeah. it seems like I'm running into more people that like just a, a couple months ago, I was working with a like a temp hire. And I mentioned that I, you know, do this privacy podcast and website and stuff like that. And he goes, he's like, hey, dead serious. Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to like start a fight. I want to know why should I care about privacy? Mm. And like, he, he was serious. He's like, tell me, like, yeah. give me an elevator pitch. Why should I care? Right. And I feel like I'm seeing that more and more. And maybe, maybe it's the bubble that I'm in, but you know, we see more articles about calls for privacy legislation and granted some of them are disingenuously coming from big tech, but mm -hmm. some of them are sincere and, you know, people do seem to at very least on some level, they seem to be recognizing that like there is some kind of problem here and they may not know what it is and they may not know much about it, but they're seeing that it's there. Yeah. As, as far as what worries me the most, uh, governments. <laughs> governments seem really big on like banning encryption and uh, mm -hmm. at least here in America on like not doing anything about privacy because they're getting all that sweet, sweet big tech lobby money. Yeah. Um, which for the record is not a conspiracy theory. We covered an article on surveillance <laughs> report that uh, most privacy legislation in the US has been written in some part by big tech going okay, through yeah. fronts. But yeah, uh, yeah, that's what worries me the most. So, all right, Nick, you're you're next. What do you, what what do you uh, what what gives you hope? What makes you worry? What keeps you up at night? Well, <laughs> keep me up at night. Um, <laughs> Well, one of the things that I'm uh, actually very uh, excited about is that privacy is becoming more user friendly. Mm. For for example, mm. iOS uh, has an easy toggle to not get tracked by Facebook anymore. Signal is user friendly. You can just uh, just create an account similarly to how you uh, download WhatsApp. You can even uh, install Graveno as a custom ROM via your web browser now. So, mm. yeah, with each of these steps. Privacy is becoming more accessible for people, and in, the, in that way, it's also becoming more attractive for people to discover other options. A lot, a, a lots of times, people don't don't even are not, aren't even aware that there are alternative options, and then in this case, it just spreads more to the masses. What would uh, worry me the, the most? Well, in this case, I would have to agree with Nate that. That governments banning encryption will be uh, on the on the top of my list. You even have the EU saying that uh, that you you should ban end-to-end -end encryption because child porn is a thing and that and that. That just doesn't add up for me. If you ban end-to-end uh, -end encryption, then criminals will still use it anyway, and you end up with criminals being more secure than normal civilians. <laughs> right. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, I mean, cryptography is just math. I mean, that that horse has left the barn. I mean, there's 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 no putting that genie back in the bottle. I'll, I'll you know pick your metaphor, but exactly. uh, yeah. So and and if you just make it, yeah, if you make it hard for regular people to use it, that just means that the the criminals are the ones that are going to only people use it. And yeah, agreed. I mean, I guess if I can answer the question myself, I, I agree with a lot of what you guys said. Um, <laughs> the way I like to say this is I've got a, a class that I teach to it's a continuing education class on security and privacy. And in the last class and the, one of the last slides, I have a bullet that says, it, you know, looking at the future, it, it's going to get worse before it gets better. I've been teaching yeah. that class for six years and I've yet to remove that bullet point. Um, because, you know, but I think, I think that day may be coming. I really think that we are getting to a tipping point. I think that, for whatever reason, both sides of the, both sides of the political aisle here in the United States are both upset with big tech. For example, you know that that means that they might be able to get together and actually put together privacy legislation because they're both you know ticked off for, for you know pick your reasons. Free speech. There's a lot of politically motivated reasons, but at the end of the day, if they can get together and do something, you know, we might actually have privacy 
you know, legislation and regulation here in the United States. That'd be great. So, I, and I also agree that I think that there's been enough things happening. There's been enough incidents that that people are are finally more in tune with 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 privacy. And I also get people coming to me. Hey, explain to me why privacy is important because I want to know. Like, I want to be convinced. That is a different mindset than that I had seen in previous years. So. That is heartening. And as far as what worries me, yeah, obviously I have the same concerns you do about, you know, banning encryption. We've been fighting this since the 90s, back since the original crypto wars, and I thought we had won that war. Uh, but, you know, it keeps coming back. And there's always the four horsemen of the in, the info apocalypse, right? The And CSAM is, is right up there, which obviously is totally ho- abhorrent. I mean, obviously that is – there's hardly anything I can think of that's worse, right? And, right. and yet – we and yet you still it's just a tool and every and at the end of the day it's much better off for all of us to be in, to to have end in encryption than not so yeah yeah all right so agreed one last question before we go what would people ask you what can i do to support privacy what can i do to further the cause of privacy what how can i make things better how can i make my you know make my world better or contribute to the future what do you what do you tell people how do you explain to people how they can get involved even if it's just giving money to organizations or, you know, what, what do you recommend that people do to help make things better, have a brighter future? Nate, let's start with you. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we, we, oh, I mean, Nick, no, you're fine. You? You're fine. I, uh, oh, that's okay. I just, I've been trying to think of an answer to this question because there, there's so many things. And I think, I think it can look different ways for different people. I think for some people, yeah, who have expendable income to, uh, to donate to, maybe a, a project that they use and get a lot of value out of or an organization like EFF who fights for digital rights. Mm-hmm. Or um, I, I think if I had to pick one thing, I would say <laughs> it's gonna, probably going to sound cheesy, but uh, just, you know, the whole being the change you want to see kind of thing, because in my opinion, mm-hmm. if, if everyone is using signal, it really weakens the argument that only drug dealers and bad guys use signal. And right. it's very <laughs> like, um, like, for example, I was trying to discuss privacy with someone one time, and uh, this this person is bisexual. And they were like, I don't care who knows that. And I'm like, that's great for you. Some other people may not want that to be known, and you right. should think about them and, and their yeah. rights and their privacy. So even if, like, you don't care who sees your emails or who sees your text messages or, you know, if you use weak passwords, which I don't know why anyone would be okay with that, <laughs> but whatever. Even if you don't mm-hmm. care, you should still normalize it for everyone else. I, I think that would be my my biggest argument is just – Try try to support the other people who do need these tools. Absolutely, and I think it was uh, you know, Snowden saying, you know, arguing that you don't care about privacy because you have nothing to hide is no different than saying that you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. It's bigger than you, and this is something that I've really been harping on a lot lately in my blog articles and in the book and in my classes. Is that privacy? While it is definitely a personal thing, it's not just a me thing; it's a we thing. Because your privacy overlaps my privacy. If somebody gets into your accounts and gets into your contact lists or looks at all your pictures, they're going to have me in there too, probably, right? I mean, if it's somebody it's somebody that I know. And, yep. you know, these are collective things. And when we all work on these things together, it makes us all better off. And so, yeah, that that is something that um, I tell a lot of people too. And I also tell people like, look, if, if you want to support the cause and you don't have time because you're a busy person, a lot of us are. If you got money, just throw some money at it. You know, it, there's a lot of groups out there like the EFF and Epic and ACLU, and there's there's so many out there that are uh, yeah, Center stop, for Democracy. Fight for Technology. the future. Yes, fight for yeah. the yeah. There's a lot of great causes out there. Find one and support these guys because they're out there you know, on the daily doing great work. And if they could just get some more funding, that would help. All right, so that that that's my spiel. So Nick, what about you? Well, I would take along with you guys and say that we do just need to normalize privacy one yeah. of one of the most important thing is that everyone needs to just become privacy aware privacy is not about uh, having things to hide it's just mm-hmm. having a choice about what data to share and what not to share and yeah. one of the best things that people can do is just reading into it and just becoming aware of the issues around them and so and that they can take actions accordingly agreed Yep. Guys, that was a lot of fun. That was a good discussion. <laughs> thanks for coming on the show and exposing a little bit behind the scenes of what you guys uh, do on a daily basis. And thanks for doing what you guys do. I look to you guys for recommendations a lot of times. So uh, I appreciate all the work and effort that you guys go into at the New Oil and uh, the Privacy Guides. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm really glad I got Nate and Nick on the show. That was a lot of fun. 
uh, we talked a lot off air too, uh, just among ourselves. And as you've probably figured out, we keep in touch uh, outside of this podcast as well. We've run in the same space for long enough that, you know, you, you meet other people and you get to know other people. And I'm really happy to become friends with these guys. They're, they're really great. They're doing really great work. Again, check out their websites. The links are in the show notes thenewoil.org and privacyguides.org. They both have great information. Definitely check those out. I also put a link to that Naomi Brockwell VPN video in the show notes. I think I talked about that before and had it in the previous show's show notes, but it really is great. And so if you're wondering what VPN to get or if you should be even using a VPN, uh, it's a great video. I would love to have her on the show, as I said uh, during the interview. Uh, I will see if I can't reach out to her. But uh, anyway, it's a great video. Links in the show notes. Definitely check that out. Now, for my patrons, I captured a little bit of bonus content as usual. Some extra questions for Nate and Nick. And uh, (laughs) by the way, we also talk about how Nate chose his name. Spoiler alert, that is not his real name. And I'm not talking out of turn here. He he, he makes it pretty public that he does that. But I, I still didn't realize that for quite a while until recently that I (laughs) that that he is uh, has a pseudonym that he uses to try to maintain some privacy. So anyway, we talk about that and some of the things in the bonus content for the patrons that'll come out on Thursday. Now I said, we'd have a bonus dear carry question and here it is. It's from Henry and Henry says, after our family has exhausted the usual uninformed topics of sports, business, definitely not politics, history, and religion, we may drift into digital privacy. What are the top digital privacy guidelines you would try pitching to a table of loving family members with minimal knowledge about computers? So I thought that worked well with today's episode because I would certainly point you at my website and Nate's and Nick's website. There's a lot of great information there if you want to learn about privacy. Obviously, my book has got a ton of information in it, and it's totally geared toward non-technical people. But as far as privacy guidelines go, first and foremost, I would say stop oversharing. That includes with social media. So cut way back on social media wherever you can. You know, look at all the privacy settings for whatever social media that you feel you need to participate in and make sure you've got those dialed way back. You should only be sharing with friends. You should not be sharing publicly whenever possible. When filling out forms for things that don't really matter, you know, contests and, you know, websites you may only use one time or for something goofy you don't really care about, you know, feel free to lie or give as little information as possible. If it doesn't really matter, then don't give them your real information. One thing that could track you by is your email. So use email aliases wherever you can. I've talked a lot about that recently, but there are a lot of free services you can use that will let you generate a dummy email address that will still route to your regular inbox, but will give you the control over that address. So you can cut it off at any time. And the people using that email address will never know what the real email address is behind that. That That's a great way to stop various websites from correlating across sites who you are. And of course, if you want to get philosophical about it and you want to have a, a, a nice topic of conversation, privacy is important on many levels, uh, but it's important to understand that privacy is a we thing, not just a me thing, because your privacy overlaps my privacy. Your data overlaps my data, especially when you're talking about your family. When you post a picture, that picture that you're posting online may have other faces in it besides your own. If you share your contacts, then you're obviously sharing information about other people that you know. That helps these companies create what's called a social graph and who you associate with and who they associate with. If you get enough of that information can tell a lot about you, including, you know, where you work, where you go to school, your religion, your political beliefs, all sorts of things. So stop, so stop, stop oversharing. I would definitely use a privacy respecting browser like Firefox or Brave and make sure you install uh, anti-tracking technology like uBlock Origin that will also block a lot of those nasty ads. But I'll circle back one more time to uh, one more philosophical aspect of this. And that is privacy is really necessary for not just for democracy, but for, for humanity. We act differently when we are being observed or when, even when we believe that we are being observed. The whole notion of the panopticon, uh, look that one up on on Wikipedia, is keeping prisoners in line by making them assume that at any moment they could be observed by the guards without knowing for sure if they are. And just that threat of surveillance is enough to make them act differently. And when we worry about things like mass surveillance, whether it be from corporations or from the government or both, we act differently. There's a reason why we have sayings like, dance like no one is watching. There's reasons why we only sing in the shower or in the car when we're commuting to work when we're by ourselves. 
when we are being observed, we act differently. And that's not because we're doing bad things. I mean, that's not why we have doors on the stalls and bathrooms. And that's not why we have curtains in our houses. There are just things we don't want to share. And there are things as a society we need to be able to do in the privacy of our own mind, in our own homes, and in private conversations with friends that allow us to grow as a society and even as a democracy that you know may be outside the norm, that may not be something we'd want to share with everybody. So kind of a, uh, a long-winded answer to your question there, Henry, but that should give you plenty of things to talk about around the dinner table when it comes to privacy. All right. Got a new show for you next week and several interviews on the horizon. Subscribe if you haven't. That way you won't miss anything. Check out my newsletter and blog. Check out the merch store if you want to get your dragon swag. Check out the brand new edition of the book. Over 200 tips and 600 pages with lots of pictures and step-by-step instructions. And of course, you can find all of that stuff at firewallsdontstopdragons.com. Thanks for tuning in. Stay safe out there. And until next week, as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge down.